May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another QQ Audio mini podcast. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So uh, today's uh, brief memory of Shinyu Suzuki from the... uh, I, from the Haiku Zendo Chronicles, Part 2, Memories of Shunyu Suzuki Roshi, is from Barbara Heistand. And Barbara wrote for the 1973 Haiku Zendo Chronicles, In June 1965, my husband and I were guests at a dinner party marking the end of a spring work session with Charlotte Silver and Charles Brooks. Among the other guests at the party were Gertrude and Dave Davenport and Louise Mendelssohn. Afterward, Gertrude told me that Louise had informed her of a Zen master who was teaching the practice of Zazen in Palo Alto one morning a week. Louise gave Gertrude the phone number of Marion Derby in Los Altos, the person to call for information. Gertrude, of course, intended to follow this up with all speed. I had become interested in the subject of Zen through painting in Sumie, in fact, a book about Japanese prints by James Michener was what started me off. In 1960, my husband and I, with our friends, the Winfield Wagners, had started sponsoring a weekend seminar in Los Altos with Alan Watts. The Watts Seminar became an annual event held every February at the Wagner House until 1970. After 10 years in reading and talking about Zen, I found it somewhat alarming to know that there was a Zen master one morning a week in Palo Alto. With my family, I left town as soon as school was out to spend the summer in the Sierras. It was sheer flight. In August, I talked to Gertrude on the phone, hesitant to ask, but curious, how are the Zen meetings going? Gert said, I can only tell you I like this as much as Dave likes golf. Hmm, considering how much golf means to Dave, this was very high praise indeed. In September, we were home from the mountains. I was still a little afraid. I learned from Gert that the group had moved from Palo Alto to Marion Derby's home in Los Altos. The only requirement was to be there at 5.45 on a Thursday morning. Finally, I went to my first meeting at the end of September 1965. I walked into Marion's front hall to find a Japanese gentleman in robes just removing his sandals. Feeling shy and foolish, I nodded. He bowed in return and smiled. It was Suzuki Roshi. After he had gone into the living room, I took off my shoes and followed him. The minute I stepped into the room, I knew I had come home. I had trouble sitting that first day, didn't know what to do with my legs. Suzuki Roshi helped me to sit on two cushions, straightened my back, showed me how to hold my hands, and told me to keep my eyes open no mention of legs. It took me about a month to figure out a leg arrangement I could cope with. Then I found out I had evolved a kind of half-lotus. 
After Zazen in service, Suzuki Roshi gave a short talk. We then adjourned at breakfast around the dining room table. It was the custom then, although I did not know it, to quietly arrange for the newcomer to sit next to Suzuki Roshi at breakfast. There were about eight people around the table. I found myself completely tongue-tied sitting next to Suzuki Roshi. Every time I looked his way, he smiled, a most beautiful smile. And with this encouragement, I finally managed to ask him how long he had been in this country. As nearly as I can remember, his answer was as follows. He had been here six years. He spoke of the scarcity of teachers here. What a large country America is. How there were only three teachers in California at that time. Then he said, I hope to stay here long enough to prepare a piece of land. In the air making a box shape with his hands. A small piece of land large enough to be my grave. There was nothing more to say after that, so we smiled at each other and turned to the general conversation. Well, thank you, Barbara Heiston. That's really, that's really uh, nice. Nice to hear your story. To hear the phrase, the, uh, she used a phrase there that's really old-fashioned, that they, uh, that they, uh, yeah, that, that she and her husband uh, did that Alan Watts seminar once a year with the Winfield Wagners. These days we just say the Wagners. That's very old fashioned. Uh, I, I believe that means that Mr. Wagner's first name was Winfield. So that couple was the Winfield Wagners. And uh, uh, back then, a woman would sign her name frequently or say she was Mrs. Winfield Wagner. (laughs) Ha ha, don't do that these days. I mean, some some people probably do still, maybe on the East Coast. Um, But (laughs) that's, you know, I noticed it. It's sort of gone out. Another thing I noticed, and this has nothing to do with (laughs) this is sort of, she has this little sentence there that she went to the, they'd go to the, spend the summer in the Sierras. Then she said it was sheer flight. Uh, that's the sort of thing an editor would take out. Like it asks questions. Flight? Oh, what? You don't like living in that beautiful area that's very expensive and, and exclusive? Uh, I guess it wasn't as expensive way back then. That's before Silicon Valley. But it's very, very nice area, Los, Los Altos, Palo Alto. Uh, but, um, hmm, and what? Were they getting away from the summer weather, uh, which is fairly mild there? But anyway, I just noticed that. And uh, then uh, when he told, her to ke- he told her to keep her eyes open, I imagine he would have said, to keep them a little bit open, uh, neither closed nor open. You know, you don't want to have them wide open. But it's interesting, he didn't, she said, no, he didn't say anything, and there wasn't any general teaching on what to do with her legs. She had figured it out for herself. Now, I would say, people, leaving people to figure things out with themselves it was a Basic method of Shunyu Suzuki in teaching, <laughs> yes. Uh, and then groups tend to, you know, uh, if they have a teacher like that, will tend to start codifying things and having, uh, you know, a uh, set, uh, something written out, you know, how to teach, how to set, you know. what, are, You know, our, our minds work that way. A lot of people might mind it. I wanted to get everything down and write it down and, you know, make little written things that other people could read and 
you know, or put everything he'd said about sitting. I still do stuff like that. But um, that's just because I'm compulsive and deluded. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the most important thing that happened in Barbara Heiston's story was he said to her that uh, he wanted to, to stay long enough to get this little square plot of land for his grave. Now, um, uh, I don't think he had any intention of being buried. Um, you know, he came from a uh, cremation uh, tradition, and uh, the, the uh, Japanese congregation tended to get, not always at all, but get cremated. But, you know, he's just using our, our language there. But anyway, what's he saying? He's saying he's committed to staying. And uh, he made his little piece of land uh, for his ashes at Tassahara. This has been a Cuke Audio mini podcast. I'm DC, Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sonora. Or you might have heard some rain at the beginning of this. We're just getting into rainy season here. And I hope we have a good amount of rain. And I hope uh, my friends uh, in America and the West Coast and other places that aren't having enough rain uh, do have enough rain. Uh, and uh, anyway, I'm here in Sleepy Sonora with... Dog at Bandita Feline Cuchita and dear lovely Katrinka, and we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. <laughs>